Hi, this is Genevieve Terrell. I'm the costume designer on Quantum Leap, and this is the Quantum Leap Podcast. Hello, Leapers, and welcome back to the Quantum Leap Podcast, Quantum Leap After Show. I am Albie. I'm Serenity. And as with me always is Hayden. Oh, you know what, Albie? If I could think of a way to combine physics and New Mexico, I'd be so happy. (laughs) And uh, with us this week, we have returning guests from the Starbright Project. We have Aaron and Michelle. How's it going, guys? Hey, Albie. Going good. How are you doing, man? Good, good. I'm so glad to have you back. Uh, What did we have you on the Western last time, right? Yes. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 3, Closure Encounters. And it was written by Rami Lohr. And the director of photography was Alicia Robbins. The editor was Piper Crows. Is that right? And it was directed by our friend Chris Grismer. So very cool. Uh, I, let's talk about this episode. I was so excited about this episode that I literally wrote a thesis on it. You wrote a thesis? I only wrote a few pages. Pages? I, I got a couple of sentences. You guys make notes? <laughs> Oh, before we go any further, we have a great guest for this episode, a brand new interview that Matt Dale did with Daniel James Chan. He's the composer for Quantum Leap, the new series. So when you hear that good music, you know, in these episodes, that's him, Daniel James Chan. And that'll be coming up later on in the show. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Dalton Ray Bunch version 2.0. Exactly. So uh, we got to talk to him. So I'm super excited for everybody to hear that. It's a great interview with Matt. Of course, Matt always does great interviews. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Let's go with uh, Michelle first, uh, since you wrote a thesis on it. Uh, what are your first impressions of Closure Encounters? Well, I have to tell you that actually I know that I put that little barfing cat in our little group chat when you asked me if I liked it. But I wanted to throw just a little curveball. But I actually really did enjoy this episode. I thought it was fantastic. In fact, I feel like this season has kind of started getting that flow that I liked about the old season or, or the, the original, what do we call it? Show. But, <laughs> um, I enjoyed, I really, like I said, I really enjoy the flow of it because I feel like it's just enough of the team, but still focusing a lot on the leap and what's going on. So that, that's just my, you know, initial thoughts. Yeah. And I think too, Michelle, part of it was the synergy between the leap and the project was really, really good as well. Just uh, the fact that we get a little bit of help from the project, then immediately Ben's doing something from what they found out. We haven't had a whole lot of, you know, a whole lot of lag, I suppose you could say, which you could easily get when there's a lot of exposition dumping. So Now, when you say synergy, instantly I go to Gem and the Holograms. So <laughs> just my brain kind of went that way. So. Me too, but I'm always there. Quantum Leap. <laughs> I'm always in Gem and the Holograms. I need to get that T-shirt. I keep seeing it here and there. It's fantastic. I am a hologram yeah, anyway. Great show. <laughs> you're, you're not the only one. Uh, the, Addison keeps claiming to be a hologram when she's walking around in real life. I don't get it. Aaron, <laughs> first I think, impression. You know, yeah, actually, Albie, I think if I actually I'm was a hologram, hologram yeah, I'm I think if I actually was a hologram, I would forget when I'm in real life and I'd try and walk through things and forget that stuff's actually dangerous. So I wonder if Addison or Ian or Al or anyone who's been a hologram actually has that problem. Yeah, they don't seem to jump out of the way of buses. Mm. I wonder if it's my son Steve's problem. He thinks he's a hologram, so he keeps walking into things. (laughs) (laughs) Him and Grayson both. (laughs) Aaron, your first impressions. Hey, the horrible episode. No, I'm joking. It was what? No, mm-hmm. it was fantastic. I, I think, yeah, like you guys have said, they, they've kind of, again, second season, they, they've taken the first season kind of, you know, work out the bugs. They, they've got the, I don't know if it's perfect yet, but they, they've got the amount of time in the present less than it was last season. So it gives us more time with Ben and whatever he's doing in the past. So I think that's, I think it's an improvement. So I've been, you know, I enjoyed the first season. I, I think this is, yeah, like Michelle said, it's, it's a lot better. It's got a flow. Yeah, the balance is about right. 
yeah, uh, I really dig this episode. It's very like X Filey or spooky, kind of maybe alien, but of course, no aliens. Uh, spoiler alert! If you haven't watched the episode, go watch that first. Um, but I, I think it's it's a really good episode. It's uh, I don't know if I'll revisit it very often, but I, I really enjoyed it. And um, so, uh, Only when Michelle, you come and visit you... us at the Starbright Project. <laughs> Michelle, what do you think of the the season two so far? Like uh, first few episodes, including this one, like overall. So Hayden and Aaron both know I kind of had problems with first season. Um, I enjoyed it, but being a newbie and really enjoying the original, um, I had a lot of problems with the first season of this new 2.0, whatever you want to call it. And, um, but I really feel just watching the last few episodes, I'm really digging it. I'm really yeah. digging it. And I feel, I, I'm not too fond of the storyline between Addison and Ben quite yet. Like I'm not, I don't, I don't want to feel like that. <laughs> In, in what in what way were you disliking them being together, or you disliking them now having trouble? Um, I don't like the conundrum she's in. Mm. I I don't like that. Uh, having had a spouse that has passed, and having a spouse that is alive, having that love for both people, and there's that question of you know, I know he'll never come back, but what if I wouldn't wish my new life away from my old life, mm -hmm. but she's in that conundrum of she has her old life back and she's in this new life. And I feel it, I guess maybe it's just a little bit uncomfortable for me because it's kind of close to home. And I feel like there's probably other people out there that have kind of that same conundrum. So that's, why I'm not feeling it. And it's not because it's not acted properly or it's not written properly. It's just my own personal opinion or feelings on it. And that's fair. I was going to say too, not just in real life are there people feeling the same things, but in universe as well. I mean, it's exactly what happened to Beth, isn't it? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because Al came back from the dead. And also I think there's parallels to Sam and Donna as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you, Michelle. Uh, Samesies, like I didn't have a spouse that died, but the person I was in a relationship didn't die. That person I knew no longer exists. So it's very similar trauma. So it's it's nowhere near like <laughs> your trauma, but it's still I'm in a state of trauma about it. it this storyline between Ben and Addison right now, I'm kind of it's it's hard because I'm kind of having difficulty with it because. I'm kind of angry with Addison and I don't like Addison's character anymore, especially when she's treating Ben badly when he didn't do anything. He just leaped to the next leap and he's leaping because he saved her and he didn't do anything self-interest. It was it was all to try to do good. And he's kind of getting punished for it by uh, Addison just being mean to him in this episode, especially I noticed. But do you think she's being mean or is she just kind of feeling defensive and not knowing how to process her own feelings because both. If you, I think both can be true. And cause I don't feel, I mean, to kindly disagree with you, I don't think she's being mean, but I feel like when you're hurt by someone mm -hmm. or you are feeling uncomfortable with where you're at, mm -hmm. a lot of times you attack the person you love the most you snap at the person you love the most. And I'm really curious weird. to see, and especially when we find out it was only eight months. I mean, yeah, it could be a whirlwind, whirlwind romance, but mm -hmm. really eight months to three years, like, come on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or how long, how long were they together before? I think they were together three years a, a few years. Yeah. Uh, at least a few years. 2018, I think was the episode in the past, right? Yeah, it's yeah, 20, so it 20 been around four three. years or so. Yeah, so that's a lot of history. Okay. You know, and she could be feeling some guilt for a lot of different things. When you feel guilt, also you attack. So, yeah, I I think my struggle is I'm trying to understand Addison's position. 
and I'm just having a difficult time. So. Well, actually, what you're all alluding to uh, is everyone's going through the stages of grief. Addison yep. and the rest of the project, but especially Addison, she's actually probably gone through most of the stages already. She's gone. She's already in the acceptance stage. She'd moved on with her life. Uh, but what we're seeing essentially in front of Ben is we're seeing the denial. He's basically, in many cases, refusing to acknowledge Addison even when she's there trying to help him as the hologram. We're also seeing a lot of anger. Mm. And the thing is, now that Ben's back in Addison's life, she's kind of, it's bringing up all these feelings that she did have when she was going through the grieving process, and it looks like she's starting to go through them again. I, I think we're going to probably see a great big blow up between Ben and Addison pretty soon. Uh, we and already did. Not, not just between the two of them, but, uh, you know, probably with a, a few people at the project as well. Uh, yeah, so it's a difficult situation for all of them. Uh, it's kind of interesting. If you think about it, they all probably have PTSD from this. They all mm -hmm. have trauma from this. Yeah. And you're reopening that trauma. You know, um, I know from, ex from my experiences, eight months, um, I was dating Aaron a quickly after my first husband had passed because it was, I didn't want to be a widow. And I already told, I told my late husband before I married him, before we started dating, well, if I wasn't going to date that you, I was going to date that guy. And it was oh. actually Aaron because I was working with them at the time. Um, but I feel like even though I moved on, there was a lot of me that hadn't moved on and took me years to process his death. And I feel like she's still probably processing his death. And so I, I, I don't know. I, I feel this is going to be a really interesting and open up a lot of can of worms because there's going to be a lot of, it's, it's a neat, what a neat thing to write as a writer. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like to reach that level of writing and that level of character development and that level of storyline, I think it's going to be an interesting thing to follow. And see, I don't personally, I don't know if I would say she was being mean to Ben. I think she was frustrated with him because I mean, yes, she's had three years to deal with his, his death mm -hmm. and he's only had a day oh, to deal true, with yeah. the fact that his wife or yeah, his wife, fiance, his fiance yeah. has moved on already and he was making a lot of stupid decisions and she's like, well, it's not the best move to make. And he's like Michelle said, he's kind of ignoring her and he's doing these really risky moves. Cause again, as Hayden was saying, you know, he's still dealing with, you know, denial and the stages of grief and all that. So I don't see it so much. She was being mean. She's just frustrated that she sees the man that she still loves, even though she's moved buried on. him and, you know, she's got a new guy in her life. She still has feelings for Ben and she sees he's doing all this, this, this stupid stuff, risky decisions that could put himself in danger. And as he, to, as she told magic, you know, or maybe she was telling Ben that, you know, they, they buried him once and she doesn't want to bury him again. Yeah. And that wording too word. of burying him is actually really important because yes, they, it's more, obviously, there was no body to bury or anything like right. that. But it's metaphorical. They've actually had to bury their feelings and they have moved on. And now with Ben being back, they're all coming back up to the surface. And she's probably very resentful of the fact that she's feeling these things again. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of anger there, too. Like, I don't want to feel these feelings, you know, and they're, now she's feeling them all over again. And in a different way, and now she's torn and confused and angry. And, and I completely agree with Aaron on the fact that she was angry with him because she did lose him in, in her way. And he came back. And even though she's not with him, I mean, to see him make all these stupid choices. And really, to be honest with you, I kind of liked those stupid choices. I'm not going to lie. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought that, like, he was really there to get the job done. Like, uh, 
hell's bells he was going to get the job done hook line and seeker and i feel like it was kind of cool to see that reckless spin because he's been so straight a lot of the times with what we see of him so i kind of like this new end yeah, I like this reckless side of Ben. Yeah, and that recklessness too, that could also be, you know, one of the signs of grief because he's probably... Oh, absolutely. Uh, he, he absolutely is going through the depression side of things too. I don't think he would have cared if he if he hadn't survived that because, you know, he had that outburst no. at Edison saying, you know, I've got to live with this for the rest of my life no matter what sort of a life I'm stuck with. You know, he, there's a very good chance that after this has happened, he's just completely over it. He's like, yeah, I'll try and do what I got to do, but if I die, I die. Big deal, you know. And that's, uh, you know, so this is really great writing. I think it's encapsulating pretty much everything that everyone's going through. Magic at the end too. He's told Addison, you know, go and see Tom tonight and don't be alone. And then we see him calling his uh, new missus, who I think is probably Beth, saying, uh, "This is, you know, harder than I thought it was going mm. to be." I really felt for magic then too. That delivery, it was it was very yeah. simple and subtle, but that delivery, you know, that was just perfect. E- Ernie Hudson can do no wrong, in my opinion. When <laughs> when uh, magic and Addison were talking, I got like I read uh, Magic's mind. Like I think he was thinking what you said earlier, Michelle. You know, three years, eight months. You know, or fiance, or just someone you're dating. You know, kind of thought. Uh, I, I I like y- your thoughts on this, Michelle. This is helping me understand this episode more. It, the, the, the episode, moreover, just gave me the feeling of, you know, that uneasy feeling when mom and dad are fighting. Mm-hmm. And you, you mm-hmm. don't want to be a part of that. You don't want to watch it. So it made a lot of the episode uncomfortable and very uncomfortable. And then a lot of us have trauma, you know, varying levels, not, you know, like what you went through, Michelle, of course. But um, a lot of people have different traumas, and this brings stuff up. So for me, it's a very touchy subject still. But I, 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 guess, I, I guess Addison wasn't being mean as much as she was trying to have the same amount of authority in the relationship without being in the relationship anymore and not giving Ben time to grieve and deal with it, I think. Yeah, I also feel like, you know – I almost feel like if she was a kid, it would have been that moment where she stomps her feet, throws her and just screams and throws herself down on the floor and has just the tincture tantrum because all those feelings, like there's so many pent up, the hurt of losing him, the hurt of gaining him back, the hurt of not having anymore, having him right there. Having this new guy, wondering if she's going to hurt the new guy, because remember, she had, she had a conversation with him and that was a hard conversation with him. And, you know, full and well in his mind, even though he's being very supportive and kind, he's probably freaking the F out. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and so I feel like there's a lot of I I, I feel like she's going to have like that moment of just breakdown Mm -hmm. and you know i don't think she's had that moment to be able to do it yet or process it really well because Mm -hmm. she had to keep in alive and i'm sure she blames a lot of having to keep in alive and not being able to keep in alive when he passed so to speak um i'm sure she has a lot of like like for instance myself I blamed myself a lot for my husband's death, even though it was nothing I could have done. He he died of an aneurysm. And um, I blamed myself not getting him to the doctor soon enough. Not You know, all these things that I should have, could have done to prevent a 23-year-old from passing away. It's been 20 years since then, but we were very young. And um, so I have a feeling like she blames herself for the project. I mean, I'm sure so does magic and so does everybody else on the team. So there's that, that self blame that they're going through. And then now having him back, like I can't even fathom what that might've felt like, but at the same time, you almost wish they would be back, you know, Mm -hmm. like you have that, that thought of, if I could just see them again, if I could just talk to them again, 
you know, what would I say? What would I do? And now she has that moment and she really can't say or do what she wants because she's with this other guy. So I think that's kind of a, a, a huge deal. Yeah. And there's probably also quite a lot of anger directed towards Ben as well. Because remember, Ben's the one that made the decision to leap in the first place and to leave Addison. And, uh, you know, he's the one she that knows put himself that now, right? in that situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, she, she yeah. knew that all, all the way along. I mean, I yes, it was to save that. Addison. Mm-hmm. But, you know, she's still, there's, there's probably still a fair amount in the back mm-hmm. of her mind that's saying, you did this to us. So, yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, and or we see that a lot as well me. when people do die often you get very angry at the person for leaving so that's another another really well written piece of uh work i i, I want to say yes hayden i agree with you but then we got to think about that all happened and they got past it because by the time they were in the old west they were having moments again you know and there was that their relationship was in full swing again so i i i, I want to say they moved past that but what I want to ask is there's got to be a difference between having a fiance, a spouse actually dying and just assuming they're dead, especially when, you know, they're in a time travel thing where they're going to be gone a while and could be anywhere in time. And what happened to Sam? And just there's a there's got to be a difference between somebody dying and just assuming somebody's dead. So I think that's might be where part of my problem is with uh, Addison's decisions. Yeah, but if you think about it, there's a lot of people out there that they don't know where their loved one has really is. You know, um, in fact, I was just watching a TikTok video. A lady was talking about her sister just up to move to Japan and um, never found out why or where she went. And so there was a few scenarios that they had played. One um, being that she just succumbed to like maybe something happened traumatically and she died like in a car accident or whatever. And then there was one where like maybe somebody hurt her. And then the other one is she went to Japan, saw everything that she wanted and then she committed suicide. So, um, but they don't know. And so there's that possibility of unknown. And as humans, like if we don't, that's a lot of times why they have wakes. So we can see the body and say goodbye. And so I feel like, uh, yes, I completely agree with you. But then at the same time, I kind of question that, that thought process because if, I don't know, maybe like if you lose your hard drive, you know, like you think about, Oh crap, all my files are gone, but really you can take it to like the computer guys and they can kind of maybe be able to save or salvage. So I see that point too, where it's like, well, maybe, Ben's still, like you said, somewhere in the space and time and all of that. So, Well, it always kind of harkens back to Beth when Al was in the Vietnam War and he and he died. And eventually Beth, you know, had him declared dead and moved on. It was a longer period of time, but still, Al was still alive, but she didn't know at the time. So it was, Addison's kind of like in, in Beth's position where... He, is he dead? Is he alive? We don't know. We, you know, there's no way to know. Like, say, for instance, Sam, is he still alive? They're working the assumption he's leaped out there. Is he leaping? I had a conversation with one of the, the Quantum Leap uh, Facebook groups. You know, they're talking about Sam being out there leaping or whatever. I'm like, or is, is he still leaping? Or is he maybe, did he leap into his own body somewhere in the future, in the past, wherever, and he's stuck somewhere and living his own life? We don't know. We're assuming he's still leaping, but until the writers decide to tell us what he's doing, we don't know. Maybe he did die. Maybe S- Sam is dead. Scott Bakula, we want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's, everybody's that's mm-hmm. on the writers, though. They have to give him something that he will want to yes. portray. I know, I know. Yeah. I still, I can still say that, though. Yeah. But yes, I mean, so... Yes, he's he's out there in time leaping, but yeah, as far as Addison's concerned, she doesn't know because they couldn't find him. And much like with Al gone in the war, well, if you can't find some after so long, you can't keep grieving because that's good. That's gonna mess Addison up. She, you know, how long does she sit there and hold for someone that she doesn't know when he's gonna come back? 
or if he's going to come back. And she wasn't married to him. We have to remember that. Right. She was not married to him. Yes, they were engaged, but, you know, <clears throat> she kind of it kind of gives her a free card in a way. But, but they were engaged on a network television show, so that heightens the <laughs> – the you know the relationship status if you think about it An- another thing i was think, thinking about can i just say ellie sure. do you think that the conflicting ho- hope of be- them coming back as well as going through the stages of grief do you think that's going to you know worsen her mental state along the way as well maybe that's part of the reason why she did give up hope she couldn't consolidate you know the conflicting things going on at the same time. Uh, it must be very, very difficult for people who have missing loved ones. Do you, I mean, they say you've always got to have hope that they'll turn up somewhere or that you'll learn the truth eventually. But at the same time, you know, you can't not, you can't dwell in the past forever. Uh, you know, you do have to grieve. You do have to move on. And it, I think it would be very unhealthy to um, have you know, so much conflict going on inside. So well, I, I think mean, that's another reason why, you know, <clears throat> I feel like move on. she was young. We have to remember she's young. She wanted to have a family. She wanted to be married. These are all things that she wished for and they were taken away from her in whatever shape, way or form. And so I feel like at some point you have to make a choice of whether or not you're going to be a victim of your circumstances or if you're going to pave your own way and move forward in your life, whatever that may be, and would, and they always with their list, well, Nick would have wanted you to move on. Nick would have wanted you to, and I'm sure she heard that a million times over. Ben would have wanted you to move on. And I'm sure everybody in that project had said that to her at one point in time. And so I find it interesting now that Ben's there you know, of course he doesn't want her to move on. Um, but it's just an interesting little thought, you know, because really that you hear that so much, you know, and he's happy for you, which of course, you know, you, you would hope that that would be the case, but poor Ben, it's only been, what, what do we say? I always forget time. It had only been about three days in total since three days in total. So, you know, no, he doesn't want her to move on. (laughs) Tom, I, I want to say I really like Tom. He's a great guy. It, none of this is his fault. You know, he just met somebody and they started dating, you know, and of course he's being sympathetic and I, he, he's got a security clearance to where she could probably tell him about what happened, you know, because he was able to text the head of the FBI and get Project Quantum Leap reopened and all that stuff. But um, so the security clearance is there. Um, but. I, he, he he seems like a great guy, but like I want to say, like if I was in that situation, I would want to say, you know what, the person you thought was dead that you were engaged to be married to, that was the love of your life, is back. Why don't you take some time, try to figure this out? No pressure. Decide what you want. You know, he didn't do that, and and that kind of surprised me because I think the my problem wasn't that. Addison dated someone else after two years. My problem is Ben's back and she doesn't want anything to do with him. I don't know about that. And you're saying that Tom could always, you know, say, we'll go back to Ben. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say when you're not in that situation, but how does he actually feel about her? We've only seen him, what, the one time last episode? So, I mean, it all depends. It's been eight months. Well, it's only, you can look at it, it's only been eight months. How attached can you get? And other times, well, it's been eight months, and some people, you know, they know they're madly in love. And so if if he is mad, and I don't know, but if he's madly in love with her, it's kind of hard to say, well, yes, I'm madly in love with you, but here, go back to your fiancé that, you know, that totally vanished died. and is still leaping <laughs> yeah. out there. Who knows if he's ever going to come home. And it, It's almost like the if you love someone, let them go, if they, and then if right. they come back or whatever. I, I don't know. I just think... If he does, if Tom doesn't give Addison that opportunity to decide what she feels, then Addison would always have like some type of resentment towards uh, Tom because of that. 
I think a part of my problem with the whole episode is I'm kind of stuck in trauma in my life. I don't know if you watch uh, Deep Space Nine, but I'm still Ben Sisko on the bridge, uh, you know, stuck there with Jennifer. I I never had any uh, wormhole aliens come help me out of it, you know. So I'm I'm still stuck in my trauma. So when I see something that like brings that trauma up for me, uh, it kind of gets me on the defensive and going through the stages of grief again because I haven't finished them, even though it's been years. So uh, I think that's just a testament to the great writing of the show that mm-hmm. it's not just characters talking. And I, you know, I don't just see um, uh, Raymond Lee and I just don't see Caitlin Bassett. I, I, I see these people as real characters and living real lives and going through real traumas. So even though it's making me uncomfortable and making me sad and things, that just means they did that good of job. So I got to give them a lot of credit for that. But everybody on the show, everybody. When I was looking the writer up, and amazingly, this is only like her third or fourth script she's written. Yeah. To give Tom his due, though, he did say to Addison when they were having that conversation, you know, you need to do what you need to do. It's Mm -hmm. not like he would begrudge her her space if she needed that to go off and reflect and figure out what she wants. Um, I actually think that magic's right. She does need a support network there. So it's probably better for her to still be with Tom in some form. Uh, But like, uh, I don't think that what you're saying is quite right. He wouldn't begrudge Addison her space if she needed it. He's just not actively Mm. encouraging it. Uh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So there was aliens in this episode. Was and I'm sure we'll talk. <laughs> well, it was about <laughs> aliens. Let's just say that the the fi- the final thing probably not so much, uh, but who knows what inspired the craft that uh, they were talking about? Um, and I want to talk more about that. But of course, we got this great interview with um, Daniel James Chan, the composer of Quantum Leap. Uh, but Hayden, don't we have to uh, pay some bills first? Yeah. Well, look, it's been quite a heavy podcast so far. I think we might have to crack open a can of cam cakes and eat our feelings for a little bit. But on the plus side, mm. they are very light. They're not going to feel as heavy as this episode did. All right. So where so, do we go? Uh, Quantumlypodcast.com slash cam cakes. That's the link. Yeah. If you go there right now, you can get up to 33% off depending on what package or subscription model you choose. You can get a subscription to cam cakes. So you never even have to think about it. They just show up at your door. Who needs all this meal prep and then to only 20 minutes to make a meal and all this stuff with fresh ingredients when you can just every day open a can of camp cakes. So go to quantumleappodcast.com slash camp cakes for more information. The perfect snack to have while watching Quantum Leap. Absolutely. I'm probably half camp cakes by now. All right. So let's go to that interview we, uh, that Matt Dale did with the composer, Daniel James Chan. Hello Leapers, this is Matt Dale with the Quantum Leap Podcast and I'm really excited today because we've got an interviewee who I have been wanting to speak to since day one. Uh, Everyone on the podcast is a big fan of his work and his contribution to the show. Uh, It is the man responsible for the show's amazing soundtrack. It's Daniel James Chan. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks for your time. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm just glad to be here. Um, Doing better now that I know that... uh, the writers have been able to resume work on the show. So hopefully the actors are soon to follow, but um, that that's always good to people getting back to work. Yeah, that's exciting. I guess, um, I guess things must be, you know, we, we all focus on, we've, we've been so focused on the strikes for the, the writers and, and the actors, but obviously it's affecting everyone else. I guess you haven't been able to do much work the last few months either for that reason. So you, you gearing up now, the writer's room is back in action. Right. And um, I don't know. It's, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing as far as the strikes, but we, we, we were able to continue working a little bit because they had front loaded the work on the season two scripts. So we were spared a little bit of the, the length of the strike because we had some things to work on as far as the post-production. Um, but then, yeah, once we got through those episodes, then we started to feel what everyone else was feeling. And, um, yeah. 
Yeah, it's a it's a very strange thing, especially when you know, you know, uh, it just didn't make sense why the powers that be were holding out for so long because they're just hurting their own bottom line. And and then after all this, they're supposed to go back into the rooms with these people and and yeah. get these people to be creative for them after, you know, making them struggle. And yeah, it's all it's all unpleasant, but I'm, I'm glad it's the end is in sight, hopefully so. Yeah, so so uh, all of us, um, I know, yeah, fandom's been behind the actors and the writers, and yeah, so great that at least one of them has been resolved. Pretty much the the longest strikes from from both organisations as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. unprecedented nearly this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll we'll definitely we'll talk about what you're doing right now with Quantum Leap and what your plans are over the coming months. But I'd I'd love to start off just by understanding a bit about your background and what. What got you into to music in the first place? Was that something that you always wanted to do? Um, how, how did you how did you get started as a composer? Well, music from a very young age was always something that I enjoyed. I enjoyed singing. I enjoy. That was like the one thing about going to church that I was excited about was the singing. Um, and my grandfather was like a self taught guitar player he liked country western music um couldn't read music or anything he was just everything by ear and i think being around that as a kid especially a very young kid and just seeing him play with his friends and it was just such a it just became part of my like fabric from very early on and i think that helped plant the seeds so that later on when you know i was in school and i started to see like the bands and the orchestras and the, and I thought, Oh, that seems like something I'd want to do. And then I had a teacher who was a big music nerd and she showed us videotapes of the PBS show, um, boss, uh, the evening at pops, which was done in the eighties and maybe early nineties. And it was John Williams conducting the Boston pops orchestra uh, doing all sorts of things, but it was so in informative and so educational. And the first time I sort of realized that all these movies that we love have all these musicians supporting everything was he had a, he did a, he did a scene from ET and he had his, you know, so I could see that, Oh, there's an orchestra there. Oh, I didn't think that that's what happens. And he was doing it live to the scene. And it was just like uh, the most magical thing, you know, I was like, I feel all these things from this, you know, these moving images and this music. And it was just like, I still get chills thinking about how I felt watching that. And um, you just chase, you just chase after that feeling, you know, so that's, uh, so he's responsible for dragging me into this, I guess. <laughs> It's funny. Uh, earlier on, I was I was thinking about preparing for this interview and thinking I'm I'm so underqualified for this interview because I'm I'm I, I have no musical talent whatsoever. And the, the one thing that I was thinking was I do not understand how people can be up on stage banging and scraping things together and it brings out this emotional reaction with me. So it's really it's good to hear that you felt the same same kind of way. And that, but you obviously took that in a. <laughs> much more structured and successful way than I did. I just appreciate it, even if I don't understand it. So it, it was always, um, it was always about film and TV composing for you then, was it? Is that? It, I, I didn't realize it, but yes. And um, it was only when I started to get further into the music studies that, you know, I knew I was like, well, I enjoy concert music and I enjoy all that. I, I didn't like, that's not where I wanted to live. You know, I don't mind working in that, but I didn't want to make my living trying to get new commissions and, um, or maybe teaching. And I just thought, no, I, I really like the challenge of, um, like, you know, John Williams is a big example, but another example is Elmer Bernstein who had such a wide and varied career. And I just think it's awesome that composers in film and TV get to do, westerns or you know rom-coms or horror movies or sci-fi and if you're fortunate you get to play in all of these different genres 
And that's just so fun. And I didn't see that kind of thing evolving on the paths of doing concert music. I think maybe it's different for like musical theater. That that could also be really enjoyable. But for me, I was like, I want to play in, you know, all those different sandboxes and get a chance to, to experiment with styles and and have fun. So I feel like that was probably the, the final motivator to specialize yeah. was with all that. And I know I'm skipping ahead, but all those different genres uh, in Quantum Leap. I mean, everything you've just said, that's that's one week to the next in QL. So, um, so I was having a look at your backgrounds, and I know some of your earlier work was in Star Trek fan films. I, I, you got an, an interest in Star Trek? Was that just a way of getting uh, some exposure to the industry? Tell me about that. Yeah, Star Trek is another key to sort of pushing me over the edge to, to going into music. I, I latched on to the next generation as a kid. Um, there's like many reasons for that, but um, Patrick Stewart's character became like a sort of role model. Um, and when he started getting into music in the show, that's when I was like, Oh, okay. I should probably pay more attention to classical music. And, uh, so I remember after he was rehearsing some kind of piece with his, uh, with his flute, I was like, I need to find that. I want to find that CD. I want to hear the rest of that music. So I went and tracked that down. And, um, so that's always been a thing. And I remember my first soundtrack CD was from the film Generations. And I just planted it in the boom box and I sat there and I just had it over and over and over. And then I dragged out the keyboard and tried to play along with it. So Star Trek, yeah, has always been um, another uh, sort of um, influence for sure, because they've always had just really great symphonic scores. Um, those TV shows all had 40, 50 piece orchestras, if not more. Um, and that just that just made it sound so awesome and um, elevated it for sure. So, um, so yeah, I always want to work in Star Trek. And then when I got out to USC for school, um, I saw that there were all these fan films. I was like, I want to, I want to do that. So I think I messaged one guy and I was like, Hey, I'm a composer and I'd, I'd like to work with you. And so he found out where he could slot me in. And that's just, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was a good, it was a good experience too. Um, getting to play in the Star Trek, you know, vibe, but also like learn. <laughs> so it was great. And sticking on the topic of Star Trek for a moment, um, one thing that I always noticed uh, back then and, and something that I think has, has changed more recently, they always had next generation, certainly always had a rotation of around three or four different composers. And it changed a couple of times throughout the series, but I was always very conscious of, okay, this is a Dennis McCarthy score. I recognize mm -hmm. this immediately and so on and so on. It, something like Quantum Leap, it's it's your voice right the way through, and I mean, you, from what I can tell, your your first kind of big responsibility in that respect was Supergirl. What's what's that like being given the responsibility to create that that musical soundscape for a show and not having to do what the Star Trek composers were doing, which is yes, doing their own thing, but also trying to match up with what everyone else was doing around them. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, with Supergirl. So I got involved in the Arrowverse because of going back to school, actually USC. Um, there's a specialized program there to, to study uh, scoring for film, television, video games, multimedia. And uh, one of the teachers I had while I was there was Blake Neely. And this was about a few years before Arrow would have come out so that's how i got to know him and um we had a good connection and he remembered that i was proficient as an orchestrator so when something came along for him where he wanted an orchestrator that was our first foray working together and so we kept doing a few things every now and then and um as he started to get all these different shows and the arrowverse started to expand he knew he needed to hire 
additional people. So um, I joined his team as an additional composer. And that's very common in the industry. You'll have people that contribute anywhere from four or five minutes to 10 maybe of score for an episode. And um, it's very common, especially in television when there's just so much and it has to happen so quickly. So um, I was like, this is great. And we, we were shuffling, I think, four shows at the time, Arrow, then Flash, and then Supergirl came along and then Legends of Tomorrow. And and so you'd, <laughs> in a week, you'd be like, I'll do seven minutes of music on this, seven on this, seven on this. Wait, which one? Oh, we got to go back to that. And and so it was a little bit stressful, but um, it was a great, great job. Um, and I didn't really have any plans of, of my I, I just thought okay this is employment I'm working I'm writing music working with good people working in a good environment and um, and then just it just kind of evolved that uh, you know he decided that oh I should I should do co-writing situations here so he promoted all of us that were there to uh, actual credited composers which is a huge deal um, there's a lot of people in the industry that don't do that, that just keep their name only on it and they don't share the credit. And um, so it was really nice to have that uh, opportunity. So on season, season three of Supergirl is when I, I started to have a credit on the show officially. Uh, and then same with Legends of Tomorrow. And um, so this is a long answer to your question, but... So in, in a way, I didn't have to develop anything from the ground up because Blake had already done that with the showrunners. And but I did kind of have to take, OK, what has he been doing? This is what they want. What, how is the show evolving? OK, where do I fit in? Um, so it was kind of a nice, like, gradual dip into the pool as opposed to just jumping in. Um, and I got just invaluable experience because I was so sheltered in a way I was so protected. Um, you know, he was kind of bearing the brunt of any of the, of the bad stuff. And then I could, you know, learn, learn some of the tricks, but, uh, yeah, Supergirl was, was a challenge. Um, there are so many different characters and you wanted to have music that, you know, evoked, their needs and, and their situations. And um, you always had the villain of the week or villain of the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was always almost wall to wall score. So it was, it was a very challenging yeah. job. Also concurrently doing legends of tomorrow, which was a similar situation. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of ways, legends of tomorrow really, really, really prepared me for quantum leap because I was also a time travel show varying genres oftentimes homage to any number of of different types of films or, or genres and uh so i kind of got all the uh <laughs> the stress of things like that out during you know that period of time um so yeah that that's kind of a roundabout way of of, of coming to that so so moving on to, to quantum piece of cake then how how did you get the, the <laughs> obviously not, how did you get the the role there? Uh, so um, Blake Neely from the Arrowverse had worked with the new showrunner for Quantum Leap, Martin Garrow. Um, so when Martin was looking to to have a composer for the show, he he came to Blake and said, you know, what what do you think? What 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 should I do? And that's when Blake said, you know, maybe Daniel's a good fit for this. So. Um, I guess my sort of demo or my tryout was actual doing work on the first episode, which for us was actually the second one that aired. So the space episode, episode two, uh, was essentially what was being treated as like the pilot. Um, and so that's where I was just like, okay, so here we go. And, um, I guess it worked out. <laughs> so. I, I'm only just making the connections here because we've been talking about Star Trek. Um, it, during episode two, I, I found a lot of the space music so evocative of James Horner's work. Um, no, sorry, Jerry Goldsmith's work. 
one of, uh, I'm thinking of motion picture. That was Goldsmith, wasn't it? Well, I, so. it, I did. I did feel uh, like we evoked either or. I mean, there's definitely like a, a James Horner moment for me. There were a few actually, but uh, yeah, definitely picking up on their their style um, yeah. because we felt like yeah, it was, it was in the nineties, I believe, right? 80s yes, or 90s. yeah, like nineties. Yeah, so, so, it's, uh, so yeah. yeah, okay. So obviously, so that that went well enough that you you got the role, and then um, going back to what you said about not having had to build something from the ground up, suddenly here you are landed with something that you did have to build from the ground up. What kind of prep did you do for that? Um, and did you did you listen to any of Velton Ray Bunch's music from the original series mm. to? create any kind of ties or were you trying to do something completely different? No, actually there wasn't a lot of time. <laughs> there was a very okay. condensed period of go, go, go. So, um, I think the keys to finding like whatever would be the longer lasting sound for the show were you know the final moment in the in the second episode where ben is leaping and you realize the connection he has with addison that was one of the key moments um also like when they talk about their their love earlier on in, in a few scenes um yeah it was trying to find a balance of we needed you know some electronic elements, we needed some synth elements, but as well as fitting into what often dips into like action adventure or um, there's always an element of a little bit of fun. It's not, it's not a hundred percent serious all the time. So we try to like find that and kind of like the, what was nice and sort of gave me a sort of grace period was that each one would have a different, sort of setting so if things weren't working or if i found something that worked better i could always sort of gradually change things as it went episode to episode so so yes i was given the task of you know from ground up what is this going to sound like but at the same time i knew a lot of the things would be doled out throughout the season so i could kind of chase that and figure it out also as we went on um i didn't reference the um earlier music from from the first show just because i knew i i knew techniques are different approaches different um i wasn't asked to do that um so yeah i didn't want to lean on that and plus they all they had live musicians every week that wasn't going to be in the cards for us so um so yeah that, that was kind of how we started at the beginning so is your um is is your music mostly synthesized? I know you've had some live musicians involved, but is most of it electronic then? Yeah, yeah, ninety nine percent. I wish there was time and and sufficient budget to do that, but it it can really. Uh, that's probably the main reason why in the, in the days of Star Trek, where they leapfrogged episodes and there were multiple composers, just because there's just so much more work involved when you have the live the live recordings um but yeah no when we really need it i definitely bring in people so the first time would have been on the western episode uh, i brought in people that i enjoy working with here in la and we had camille miller on violin and george deering on guitar and a few other instruments to and it always just enhances everything when you have that live element it's just, yeah. And for me, it really like helps me feel like there's a performance because I, I'm not 99% of the time I'm here banging on my keyboard. Oh, did you guys hear? No, nobody heard that. Okay. So um, <laughs> it's nice to like, to feed the musician part that, mm -hmm. you know, you're trained and programmed to, to do everything for a performance. And um, whenever you work with live people, it's, it just feel everything feels more complete and it feels just more alive and more, more important. Um, but it's always great. Sure. 
we we've talked about um or we've, we've alluded to all the different genres that you you got to play with and that's uh that, that pivoting you must have to do week on week can you talk to me about either some of your favorite moments and your favorite places to play or some of the ones where maybe you were less comfortable and some of your bigger challenges the aside from the the space one which was just a hundred percent challenge all the way through just figuring it all out mm -hmm. um the the box the boxing episode episode three came up and that i felt a little a little fish out of water there because we were in the 70s and you know i didn't know how how far i should take the music you know how 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 much should it sound like the 70s how much should it be more neutral and stay grounded in the season of the show and we're still so early on and um, that one was a challenge. And then when I thought about, okay, I, I really do want to lean into how the Rocky movies feel, um, especially for all of the actual fight and, and the, emo the emotion of, of the fight, you know, that's, what's great about the Rocky scores is they have not only the, the energy, but there's just this really great feeling you have with all the themes. So I wanted to sort of, emulate that and um i i took the swing and i was like i don't know how what is the showrunner gonna think about this and he liked it so i was like okay because if he wanted something else i would have had very little time to to come up come up with it so that was the first real big hurdle for me and then um but then i really enjoyed it i thought our guest guest star on that episode was fantastic i remember even before I, I work on the episode, I'm watching the cut and there's always temp music from other things, other projects, sometimes from our show. And uh, I remember getting to some of his scenes and just being very, very moved. And that's always a good sign because I know how the sausage is made. And if I'm like reacting before I can even work on it, that's when you know, oh, that's a good performance. Um, so that helped so much. And then I think the way he played off of Raymond really, that's when I knew I was like, Oh, this is good. This is a really good cast and this is going to work. Um, I really felt like it captured the spirit of the, sh the, the whole franchise for me. That was like the first time I, I really felt like, Oh, this is what I remember feeling watching the original quantum leap. I think a lot of us um, were saying the same thing at home as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the Western, I love, I love Westerns. Um, I was fortunate on Legends of Tomorrow. I think we did like, I don't know, four or five Western flavored episodes. And I just looked forward to those all the time. One, one, one year we had a cowboy narrator and I actually got to co-write the songs with one of the writers from the show. Nice. Um, I, I just, I love Westerns. If they did a whole season of a show and, and said, <laughs> in the, I'd be like, Oh, in heaven. Um, so that one, I really, really, really enjoyed. Um, I also liked the little, uh, the sort of future, the future plot or whatever you want to call it, the little threads throughout season one about what's, why he's, he's moving towards the future. And that had a kind of evocative music that I, I really enjoyed, um, of course, the t the twelfth episode was an important episode with the trans athlete, so that one was was important for different reasons. Um, I enjoyed the naval episode fourteen, um, and it had a Legends of Tomorrow alumni in that one, which was great. Um, and the season finale was just was just really great too, really really action packed and. I thought yeah. it was solid. It was a great episode. So many cool spaces to play in. And you just got me thinking, um, when you were talking about taking episode three, for example, being being back in the 70s and trying to evoke that, What there's, there's a lot of um, pop and rock music tracks that get used in the show as well. At what point does that come along? Are you working around that or do you compose the music and then that gets decided after? And the reason I ask is because I notice a lot of the time that your work will nicely segue in and out of the, the pop track. So I'm assuming 
Oh. That's already in there. I'm glad you you appreciate that because yeah, sometimes we go through great care to make that those transitions work. Um, most of the time, the songs are decided before. So mainly because you know the writer, or the director, or the showrunner will have a very specific one they really wanted, and then you have to be sure that the licensing can be achieved for it which can take time and so that gets that process gets started before i start uh sometimes there's a last minute switch and they can't use one and uh but i'll still adjust you know if a score piece comes before or after and and touches the end of the song or beginning of the song we'll make it work musically so that you don't get this jarring sense of oh now we're in a song and now we're in a score um but yeah, actually, the music music edit uh, supervisors um, they also worked on Legends of Tomorrow. So there's a lot of um, Greg Berlanti universe, yeah, that that perpetuates, which which is great because it's always good to work with people that you know you know have your back and and yeah. uh, you can depend on. And yeah, for sure, it, it's. Um it's very rare on first viewing that I even notice when your music go goes in and out of the, the pop music, suddenly there's someone singing in the background and I realize, Oh, actually we're not in score anymore. So it's, it's that mm. invisible. I, I, I loved, and I, I need to ask you about this because I, I loved probably my favorite piece of your music from uh, the first season was the tail end of, episode three which does coincidentally come out of some pop music um the name escapes mm-hmm. me at the moment but it's a it's an la band i think that um does the piece when addison everyone's at addison's flats and everything looks okay and then magic gets the call and it all goes very dark and it moves into your piece and you, you have that shade of the original quantum leap theme absolutely chilling and what a great way to use the theme <laughs> was it your idea to, to use a bit of the theme in there we no, we no that from... was that was from the showrunners uh they really wanted to do that especially because you saw the old hand link so they really wanted that connection um i was the, the tricky part for me was because the original theme it needs time for you to hear it it, 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 it can't be compressed into a quick two second thing, although we got close, I think. Um, so that was kind of frustrating for me because I really, I want, I wanted it to like have more, I wish the shot had been a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was a really fun, fun thing to do. And I, I think, I think that was a good place to do it. Like you say, um, I know a lot of people wish that there was a similar kind of theme song. I just, I just don't know if that would work for the style of the show because a lot of shows now just don't have your minute yeah. plus long themes um, anymore, which it, it it's good and bad, you know? Um, so it was nice to, to fit that in there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a different world now. And it's, I find it interesting that, yeah, we still see people saying, I want Scott Bakula back. I want the saga cell back. And I want a proper theme tune. And I think, well, we've lost about five minutes since the, the early 90s per TV hour. Mm-hmm. How are we going to get a theme tune back, whether you want it or not? Um, you've got that that few seconds with the logo coming up, which which works to, to set the tone for the show. But it is, we are in a very different world these days. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've shared with you my favourite moment from the first season, and you've talked about all your, your highlights from the first season. I know we've got to be a bit careful because this is going out alongside episode three. We've still got at least five more episodes, hopefully several more than that to come. But what can you tell me about the work you've done in, in season two and some of your highlights? We do already know the the loose plot lines of, or at least the, the styles of all the first eight episodes. So if you want to say the episode said in Egypt, that's not going to surprise anyone. But what, what, are, what are some of your, your favorite moments from the well, second season? The, that episode surprised me when I saw it. I was like, what? Yeah. Um, 
no, I, I, uh, that was, that was one of my favorites from season two, actually. Um, this season has been great. I mean, I loved the first season, but, uh, there's just something, there's this like momentum that I think this season has, um, the situation Ben is put in, um, I think is really interesting. You know, the, the, the gap, um, how he's dealing with Addison, how she's dealing with it. There's just, there's good drama there. Um, there's some new characters, of course, every episode, but there'll be someone that, you know, might appear in a few episodes. That's that I, when I first thought about it, I was like, how is this going to work? And, um, really cool the way they the way they've threaded that through the season and no there was just so many fun moments um yeah the the sort of close encounters episode um was so fun to do uh it's just always great to play in that sort of like uh tone clusters and and you know, fun atonal violins and uh, jump scare type things. And, oh, it was just so fun. I remember the first pass through, um, I was actually told to like, no, no, amp this up, make it more, make it bigger, make it, you know, more like those kinds of movies. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, this season so far has been fantastic. Great, and hopefully, uh, like like we were talking about at the start, hopefully you'll be um, back to work soon, working on some more. At what point would you expect to start getting hold of scripts to start thinking about what's coming up? I'm not going to try and get anything out of you if you already know what's coming up, but uh, do, you, do you get an, an early warning maybe over the next few weeks? Do you think the writers will start sharing some ideas with you? I think... Usually I only get roped into information um, if there's going to be something particular in the music that I should watch out for or prepare for. Mm -hmm. um, or if they, if they might know, oh, he might want to record something, you know, they might tell me, by the way, this is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, I think so far I, I can wait for, for the work to be done and then jump in. Um, yeah. Well, you you can wait. Uh, we can't. We're we're super excited, and um, I'm so glad that as this goes out, we've got another five episodes uh, to look forward to and find out what's going on in Egypt and listen to to more of the different genres that you're pulling from. So, Daniel, it's been so great chatting with you and uh, hearing more about your process. I feel like I've learned a bunch and uh, it's been really great reminiscing about some of the stuff from season one and looking forward to what's uh, coming up for season two. Daniel, thanks so much for your time. No, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk about the work um, because like I said, you know, I spend most of my hours isolated and, and um, you just don't know how something's going to play out or how people are going to react or so it's it's nice once things aren't in a vacuum anymore and and to realize people are paying attention and um and valuing the work is is just so gratifying so uh, i really appreciate it thank you and we're back what a great interview with daniel james chan composer thank that's you, a daniel. score huh? great yeah. score uh oh and Beautiful great score music. Yeah, beautiful music. It really, uh, especially in these emotional scenes with, I know we've been talking about like just the relationship between Ben and Addison, but like every scene, you know, the, the score really, uh, or the needle drops just tells us how to feel and helps us feel the way I think the creators want us to feel. Um, I know we talked a lot about Addison and Ben, but uh, there's other things that hap happen in this episode. So why don't we talk about that for a while? But of course, if you feel free to talk about uh, Batty, if you want Addison and uh, Ben. Um, the first thing I want to mention is, um, the preview for this was like, uh, you know, Roswell aliens. And then even Ben says at the beginning of the episode, all I have to do is prove that aliens exist. But, uh, so far, no aliens in this version of quantum leap, right? Nope. Yeah. Just rotten kids tipping cows, right? <laughs> right uh, and, and a guy named Hunt with a silent sea. 
garden gnomes. That's what it was. Garden gnomes. So he says something about like the cows. He says that the yeah. farmer says something about the cows. It, that was an interesting opening to to kind of get you into the the mood of what was going on. It reminded me of the Halloween episode from uh, last year, uh, just for a few seconds when that started on Ben and zoomed out. Um, but yeah, that was weird. It's just garden gnomes. I don't know what was going on there, but I guess you got to leap in somewhere. Yeah. I really liked the I kind of jumping, I guess, but I kind of I wasn't sure I was going to enjoy the sheriff of the town, but I really liked the development with his character, too. Um, I liked the relationship that he and Ben had. Um I thought it was kind of an interesting way that they wedged it in there and to find out he was the one who called Ben um, and all of that. I thought that was a really neat way to bring everything in and tie it together. That whole, I don't believe in aliens, but I believe in my granddaughter line. I was like, (laughs) oh, right to the heart. Uh, that's Lewis Hertham. I think that's how you pronounce this. I don't know. Uh, He was in true blood, Westworld, a bunch of things. Uh, To me, he had that, uh, like old fashioned manly feel to him. Like while I was watching this episode, I just was like, Oh, I wish there wasn't an actor strike right now. Cause I so want to talk to this guy, his voice, his demeanor, like everything in this episode. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of good acting in this episode, especially with uh, Raymond and Caitlin. But uh, as far as the leap story goes, I think this guy carries most of it. And it's just that, that, that like confidence that you don't see very often anymore. And I just, I just love that about his character. It's very blue, blue collar, very blue collar. I hope you're yeah. writing down the names of all these people that we haven't gotten a chance to interview yet. So that once the oh, strike's yeah. over, you can just send out email after email after email and, you know, go through yep. the back catalog. Uh, I, I, there's a wish I, list yeah. and he's on yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember some of my theories that I've had so far, Alby? Um, I think that we're starting yes. to see yeah, one theme that just keeps popping up. The government can't be trusted because here we've got, you know, the military framing teenage girls just so that they're, you know, probably illegal um, or at the very least top secret um, projects aren't going to be uh, aren't going to be revealed to anyone. Uh, you know, it takes blackmail to actually you know, resolve the whole the whole thing. And they're willing to put a girl in a coma and probably kill Ben in the process too, just to keep it secret. You know, I think that this theme of, you know, don't trust your government just keeps flowing through. And I'm sure somewhere down the track, it's going to be affecting the project. Speaking of the project, where was this episode set? Stallions Gate, what? New Mexico. New Mexico, where the, where the original Quantum Leap was. Really? Is it was yeah. that maybe I I missed that tie-in? Is this where uh, Project Quantum Leap eventually ends up? This I'm ranch? pretty sure it is. Stallions Gate, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. So yeah, not far I, from I where the first nuclear Gate. bomb was detonated. You know, I was sure we were going to get a connection to the original series when when they said that, and what ends up happening at the end. Um, First of all, I think that Hannah could end up being a love interest somewhere down the track. And I think, you know, I had the the theory a bit earlier on, too, that we were going to see, you know, Ben start to, you know, spread his seed throughout time a little bit. So it wouldn't well... surprise me if we saw <laughs> if we saw Hannah somewhere down the track again. But what does he do? He convinces her to, you know, go and study science under the tutelage of uh i can't remember the name of the professor now but um go and, and study Moriarty. Right. Uh, wrong professor i was wondering if that was going to be a tie-in to sam's original mm. love oh. like maybe she was the lineage maybe she's her mom or i don't know something along those lines i mean no, it- no, they were in 79 so or 49 so uh. Yeah, it's not out of the realm of possibility. But uh, that's where my brain went instantly. I was like, oh, "I wonder." Do you think she's Donna? I forget mother. Sam's let me love life. Donna, Lisa. Donna. There we go. There we go. Donna. Yeah. 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 And I was but, like, maybe look, she's got a connection to Donna. Well, 
I'm I'm thinking maybe she since she's in the area and by the time she graduates, you know, she'll have been in the you know research fields for quite some time. I reckon she's probably going to end up having something to do with at least the original project, seeing that she's in the in the area in you know a time that's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, so I, th I think we're probably going to see Hannah again, and I think that she's going to end up, you know, causing something in either the original project or flowing through to the current project. So, what was it called? The gun thing that you always talk about? Well, Chekhov's gun. Uh, Chekhov, Chekhov's yeah, gun. Chekhov's gun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you don't include something unless it's going to be important. And, I mean, Ben could have leapt immediately after he'd, uh, you know, blackmailed the military guy and essentially resolved everything. But, no, he, he they had to show that scene of him encouraging Hannah to go and, you know, study the sciences that she wanted to study. Um, it's got to end up being me. important somewhere down the track. See, I was wondering if she was supposed to actually be somebody... In reality, I was, that's what I was wondering. Well, that brings up my thoughts. I, I'm of two minds of Hannah in this episode. One is uh, if I didn't know what I knew, I would feel like the Hannah storyline is a little out of place in the episode. But at the same time, I feel like in the classic episodes of Quantum Leap, there was a lot of times that side character. Uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, Piggy Suey, Buddy Holly or something like that. <laughs> Just that side character that the whole reason he was there was to help that person make the right decision right. To, to help them out before they could leave. So maybe Ben was actually there to help Hannah decide about that. Well, what is it that you know, though? You may as well tell everyone. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, I'm all nerd boy. And I look at all the publicity stills, all the cash shots. Uh, I look at IMDb. I look at all the stuff that's publicly available, uh, which I wish I didn't because then I wouldn't be kind of spoiled uh, that this actress who plays Hannah is a recurring character and a new member of the cast. But at this point in my uh, watching of Quantum Leap, I still don't understand how that is possible because she's in the, what was this the 40s, 50s? 40 like yeah. The 1949. Yeah. And uh, she's a waitress. And she's a waitress. So none of it makes sense to me. But also, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the Quantum Leap trailers that come on right after Quantum Leap, the last couple of weeks, they just spoiled everything. They, they're showing Hannah in different time periods, the same actress. Oh, okay. See, and, I was kind of wondering if she was a leaper herself. Yep. And they showed, and they showed uh, before they revealed that, uh, before they revealed that Tom and Addison were together, that was right in the preview for next week. So it totally ruined that whole part of the episode where uh, we, we were supposed to watch the episode, not knowing that they were together or finding out when the writer intended us to find out, but just the preview spoiled it. And from what I understand, not only the fans are upset that they got spoiled on that trailer, but a lot of the people uh, producing quantum leap were upset that they did that trailer like that okay. because it totally just gave away that storyline. So yeah, do you so think she's going to be another Leaper, or do you think that she could be maybe a new hologram for Ben, and maybe she's just like Al whenever, you know, remember, remember whenever Sam leapt to a particular time period, Al would be like, all right, so that's what I'll dress up this time, dress up as this time. So do you think maybe that could be the case? She might end up being another hologram for Ben, and she just gets into the time period. Well, well, I don't know if you saw Christopher and mine's uh, martini cast where he was drinking martinis and we were just having a good time and talking about the trailer for uh, season two. But uh, we went frame by frame pretty much and it, like examined it. And uh, part of that in the, one of the previews, Ben tells her that he is leaping through time and, you know, you're OK with that. So she's not aware of the time travel before he tells her. Uh, so I don't think she's a hologram. I don't think she's a leaper. So it's very confusing at this point, which so I maybe love. Maybe he just it's keeps not... leaping into, you know, time, her time period, line, right? Yeah, within her time. Yeah. Line. Well, that's kind of interesting. I don't know. Maybe she's playing dumb for a reason. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, true, too, because we're only getting two seconds here or there and trying to make trying to figure it out. But it makes it fun. But she was a really good uh, actress, good character in this episode. I really thought that was nice. 
It, it, and, it, you know, it's sh shown a spotlight of how, uh, you know, women aren't just intelligent now. They've always been intelligent, and but they've always been dismissed. Yeah. And, you right. know, it, I like some of to, the lines um, that she had. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like the one about I think I've said this sometime in the past in the podcast as well. But, you know, it's like any advanced technology is akin to magic. Like if you showed people from even 20 years ago, some of the stuff we're doing now, they think we're magic, you know? And so uh, it makes perfect sense throughout the context of the leap as well, that people would be thinking that this is aliens instead of an advanced uh, plane that the military's uh, testing and the night vision goggles, they'd easily be confused as aliens instead of, you know, just workers in protective equipment and, you know, it, it makes perfect sense. I, I, that's what I thought would end up being the case. Um, so it wasn't um, wasn't completely out of left field. I thought it probably was some sort of military operation all the way through. Um, and I guess well, that's why they... I was going to say, I really liked how they figured out whatever the serum or the, the adrenaline that he had used in order to... Gamma Blue 5. Um, yeah. And then... For I, I like the fact that even though he was passed out because she was this hologram, Addison was this hologram that she was able to see everything. Yeah, I thought that was a really kind of yeah. a neat way to spin it. Like what a like clever, clever, or creative way to write that. Yeah, because that's never been used they, before, right? No, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. No. What they could have even done. This is what I would do. I would record everything that Addison's seen, and I'm pretty sure they do record it anyway because they. They monitor it from the project. I'd be wondering if there's a way that they can quantum leap that footage into the past so that they've got more evidence of everything that had been going on when they want to blackmail the military people. Hmm. That'd, be, that'd be really interesting to see. There was only one thing with the, you know, timey-wimey stuff that bothered me. Um, ben wanted quick results for what he'd been ingest, in, injected with. And they were analysing it at the project. How did they get a sample of his blood? Maybe they read the analyzed report, the analysis. That, well, of that's it? that's the only thing did that I could pop think up of on as the well. Screen? I think they they were waiting for because the, they said something on the show. I think about um, they they were drawing his blood at the hospital, and I thought they I thought they sh it showed like a picture of a scan a scan. Oh image of that toxicology report okay. like and then they were able to take that and that's when they figured out what the gamma blue whatever was in a system and okay. then See, they were I, able the to way do... i'd interpreted it was that they were actually analyzing his blood i didn't think that they were analyzing the oh. the reports toxicology so, report well, my, yeah my immediate thought was they're like 70 years in the future so they don't have to wait for anything Okay. As soon as Ben, I know because it was loading. You know Remember, it was kind of loading. But before that, though, the, like a page showed oh. up on the screen. That I, page was that what Ian was uh, pressing F five repeatedly for to refresh the screen. Something like that, yeah. Right, but uh, I, I think that's because as soon as it was completed in the past, then it was available in the future. I don't know. Yeah. It's that whole uh, Back to the Future time travel. Yeah, well, the thing, the thing is, you know, nothing changes you. until something happens to change it. So they had to actually wait for them to do the analysis so that they could, you know, have the results there. Um, yeah, so that thank you, Michelle. You, you've answered my question there. That was good. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the, just the synergy between the project and the leap I think they've got it perfect now. Um, it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like two separate shows. It feels like, you know, the project is there to back up the leap. And I, th I think that people who have been very sceptical and um, critical of the series so far, I think probably will be feeling a bit better now. Uh, so, Can yeah, I, um, I hope they keep it up. I have a question. So in the past episodes, especially last season... Um, it seemed like Ben just had no care in the world of talking to Addison in front of people. I, that bothered the bejesus out of me. Like, I don't know about you guys, but that 
you know, because I know Al and Sam are really careful about that. Just, you know, the way that they talk to each other. Um, I'm hoping that this time around they pay a little bit more atten- attention to that because yeah. that was something that that really felt out of place last season. Yeah. I don't know well, what I've you guys. been liking is that it has been seeming like Ben's been getting a lot better at the double talk, which is where he says something in public that the people there will interpret one way, but he's got that Mm -hmm. other meaning that the hologram and that the people monitoring at the project will know straight away. Like where, when he said, uh, I'm hoping to get some expedited results, Addison knew straight away, right, I've got to get these results for him, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I, I think they're getting better, but Mm -hmm. towards the end, there was like uh, when they were blackmailing the military guy, it felt like Addison was a part of that conversation where they were doing the blackmail. And I'm like, well, why are you saying this, Addison? It doesn't seem like he's going to be able to hear you. So <laughs> that was I think they were doing right? there kind of like they did in the episode yeah. when they had the, um, I forget her name now, the victim Kate. was testifying yeah. and she was testifying and Sam was basically relaying her words. I think they were trying to do, trying to do that, that Addison was saying it and... Ben was basically repeating it as if he had seen it. See, I saw that moment as almost like, uh, like I mentioned last week, I was yelling at my screen. I think she was basically yelling at the the hologram environment she was in, like like somebody would yell at a movie or television show. Like, you know, (laughs) why don't, you know, don't separate, don't go in that room, that kind of thing, you know? (laughs) So... Uh, we, we saw a couple things in this episode I wanted to mention. Uh, they mentioned Janice. She got a name check. She's with the NSA in Hawaii. And that Im- immediately made me think of uh, the show that comes on after Quantum Leap, the new Magnum P.I. That takes place in Hawaii. I wonder if Janice is going to show up on Magnum P.I. That'd be cool. Well, we could maybe end up somewhere down the track getting the Magnum P.I. crossover that Don Belisario always wanted to do. Uh, that'd be interesting. We won't have Sam leaping into Magnum, but we, we might have something similar. Oh, that would have been cool. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I've never watched the new Magnum PI, but if Ben leaps onto it, I'm going to watch the whole series. So Same that's here. all you got to do. Make, put some time travel in it. And I'll watch it. Is the new um, Magnum you PI say? a continuation of the old one or is it a complete reboot? No clue. Because if I it was a, a continuation, there's another quantum leap connection there as well because, uh, Sam's sister is married to one of the one of the people there. So that'd be cool if that actress was on the show now. I don't know. I want to now I want to watch it, but I don't because is it time travel? I don't think so. It's got to do with uh, mustaches, though, right? So I do have a fear of mustaches. I forget what that's called, but I do have that. Um, What else happened in this episode? I, uh, you know, speaking of like um, frustration, Ben was so frustrated with Addison while he was just going through this leap. And it got to the point, uh, you know, where he injects himself with adrenaline and he's yelling at Addison and he's saying everything on his mind that he's been holding back this bridge. And, you know, that was a time where I identified with uh, Ben in that current situation and was going, yeah, tell her exactly. (laughs) What do you think about that whole uh, confrontation between the two of them? I liked it myself, I, and I do like the fact that he was telling her that, well, you're my hologram, and you're, you're, you, I can't do this without you. And I didn't realize what he meant at the time until later on when she's telling what she saw. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's what he meant by – I it thought was it was just – very you know, risky, though. Support. Yeah, it was very yes. risky, though, because remember, if there was an aircraft carrier that went over again, they've got the the blockers for the signal. There's that every mm-hmm. chance that uh, – Addison could have ended up blocked out and they wouldn't have ended up with any evidence of what happened. So, But they would have because he was, the sheriff was still waiting outside with the camera. Well, that was, watching that was more with the to... evidence of showing Ben being dragged away and then being brought back, but nothing so much of what was happening inside. And as the military guy said, oh, yeah. the all they have there part. is Ben trespassing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So it was well, risky. Obviously, it paid off, off, but they're lucky they figured out it was an aircraft carrier and that it was very unlikely that it was going to happen again. But that's well, interesting too. We get a little that. bit more about you know the uh, the 
technology side of things, their signal can get jammed. And that means that there is something that's being projected into the past, which Ben is, you know, tuned into. Um, it's not like he's they're directly, you know, broadcasting into his brain. They're projecting something into the past and outside things can block it. I mean, we have seen stuff like that in the original series as well, like um, when the in, in the radio uh, station episode, you know, Al turns bright blue when he's too close to the transmitter. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that, that was, was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, another thing that could have happened is when they took Ben into the, the wherever they're at, um, if they had the proper shielding in the building or if it was far enough underground, that could have blocked Allison's signals possibly. Yeah. And it's a good thing that she's not directly connected to his mind as well, because if he's unconscious and if that was the case, then you'd expect that Addison would get blocked out then too. So yeah, yeah it's a good thing that the, this projection that they do of the holograms um, seems to be somewhat separate to the minds. Obviously they need, they still need the neural link somehow. And thankfully there's, you know, more links than just Sam and Al had had, for example. Like, it seems like just about anyone is able to connect to Ben now. There must be some yes. connection through Ziggy that anyone can connect to now. They're better at it. Better technology. Better yeah. technology. Yeah. But at, at um, least, you know, the fact that it's more like radio or television waves being projected into the past rather than just projecting into the mind means that there's more possibilities for more interesting ways to solve problems. And I'm keen to see it. My head canon is uh, just assumes it's like the difference between analog television waves and digital television. Totally different systems work, totally different things, ways, but they're doing the same thing. And this one's improved. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about the two girls um, that were in this episode that actually were the reason for uh, Ben having to investigate this. Allison Thornton, who played Carrie Baker, uh, she was the one that was driving. Uh, what did you think about uh, – I? that situation. What do you think about her character? I thought she did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. Very sympathetic. I thought she was believable. Uh, I, I noticed in one thing, something that jumped out at me, you know, talking about crazy theories. Um, if you remember, uh, Carrie Baker was reading to Melanie uh, Hunt, uh, a pa part of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, she said that would be a queer thing to be sure. So that, you know, oh. Alice in Wonderland is something usually writers bring up to symbolize something. And uh, I've had this weird feeling theory that's hopefully not true or maybe not true. I don't know. I just don't want if it's true. I don't want to spoil it, but I, not that I know of. But that whole thing where I think Ben's like in a simulation or a game or like Hayden was saying, maybe a dream or a coma or something. So Alice in it's Wonderland. In <laughs> Alice in Wonderland is is basically a dream, right? If if I read the book right, yeah. Uh, you would know, Michelle. You're a doctor and stuff now, aren't you? You're a bachelor, <laughs> you're master, master, master. Ooh, the master. I have the masters. I now. like that, Master Michelle Moss. Is that how you say it? <laughs> the <laughs> masters in education now. Albie, wow. we okay, grant so you a position on the council, but we do not grant you the rank of master. I understand. <laughs> I have not earned it. Uh, Michelle, do you know anything about Alex's adventures in Wonderland that might apply to Ben's journey right now? Um, you know, I have not read that. I'm more of a Disney Alice in Wonderland, to be it's honest. Well, in, the movie, in the movie. Is it a dream but, in the movie? Or I, yeah, when I read it, I thought it was movie. a dream, right? Yeah, okay. it's a dream in the movie. Um, it's a dream in the book, but too. I, I, I find it – I kind of went a different way when you said that quote. Okay. Um, the two yeah, girls, me too. Me too. Queer. Yeah. I thought that might have meant that too, that they might have been a couple. And maybe it, it was in the original uh, script, it might have said something about that. Maybe it was cut for time or something. But I kind of got that feeling too. Yeah. Because it seemed like – I mean, yeah, they were best friends and all. But, you know, and that, as soon as you said that, I'm like little light – little ding ding yeah. dings are kind of going oh. off you know and yeah. um especially with you know grandpa saying all the things that he said that she was kind of going a different path mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he had a list a checklist of all these things and with him being blue collar probably very conservative in that regard and you know i feel like maybe it was one thing that he and her battled 
before this. And so he kind of had that guilty conscience. And mm-hmm. so that's probably one of the reasons why he called Ben into this is to kind of maybe not backpedal, but kind of hopefully get his granddaughter back in some regard. I don't know. That's a, that's a neat. And I, I got that feeling too. Fine. Like maybe they were in a relationship and the grandfather knew it, but see, I got a different impression. You know, we all bring our own stuff to it. I thought that that whole quote about like, he didn't believe in aliens, but he believed in his granddaughter. I think his love for his granddaughter was more important than anything society would say about her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if anything, he was just trying to protect her, but still let her live her life and have her love. But see, I don't they know were how I got that of, out of all that, but that's what I felt. When it I was beautiful. It. I, I I believe that he got to that point. You know what I mean? I think it took him a while. And sometimes the fear, you don't realize it until you've got that fear of losing somebody kind of, you know, maybe this was that after this happened and he's like, what am I going to do? And he's grasping for straws and he's like, I, I, I really do love her and I don't want to lose her. I've already lost her mom. I don't want to lose her granddaughter. Yeah. So I think that maybe that played into it. You can tell Michelle's an English teacher, putting far more <laughs> thought into the text than, you know, the writer did. <laughs> um, yeah. Before our overall thoughts and our final thoughts and our ratings, I want to talk a little bit about things that might have bumped you in the episode. Uh, the only thing that really bumped me a little bit was – uh, like there's supposed to be this mystery about aliens and, you know, the Roswell-esque thing. Uh, but like the whole time I was watching it, I was like clearly a helicopter, clearly night vision goggles. Like to people in 2023, this future scary technology that might look like aliens to us looks like everyday stuff. So I was wondering if you felt the same way while you were watching the episode, like clearly a helicopter or some, I guess it was a jet, but I thought it was a helicopter and night vision goggles, even though there was three of them. So they kind of tried to hide it, but th- not for one second did I think there was green glowing eyed aliens. Yeah. I was yeah. the same. Um, I immediately thought military project as well. So, I mean, it didn't take anything out of the episode for me made me feel smart um but yeah yeah, like i I would never think that this was anything to do with aliens either so but that that's Mm -hmm. not a bump for me i mean just you know logic yeah uh aaron i was gonna say in, in this this uh version of quantum leap they are trying to keep it more grounded for the most part like the halloween episode Whereas, you know, in the, the original Halloween episode with Sam, they did kind of put the supernatural aspect a little bit more. Where yeah. this one here, everything's well, in, explainable. So. Yeah, well, in the Alien episode originally, what was it, Starbright, Starbright, Star, Starlight, yeah. Starbright, you know, the aliens existed at the end. So mm-hmm. it, in the original version, you know, any time there was any allusion to something supernatural, that supernatural entity would exist. Whereas I think in this series, they're doing a better job of, you know, ha- always having some sort of a rational explanation mm-hmm. for it. Um, and not even leaving it up to any ambiguity. So, right. And I like that. Mm. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. I see it didn't bother me. Good. Anything bother you about the whole episode? Doesn't have to, but just in case. Not really. Of course, again, I'm, I'm always a little more easier to please of Quantum Leap. So, mm-hmm. but, but yeah, no, I, I thought it was, yeah, I thought it was a great episode. I, I, nothing really stuck out at me as a sore point or anything. Okay, good, good, good. Michelle? No, I, I hate it's probably very, conf- probably shocked that I'm saying this, but <laughs> I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And I thoroughly enjoyed the last episode prior to that. So, and I really, I was to the point where I didn't know if I wanted to podcast about it anymore because I just kind of, I, I, I enjoyed the first series, whatever you want to say, the first (laughs) round Mm -hmm. a lot. I am not a huge TV person. I will watch something and lose interest. I am like ADHD mm. of TV. Aaron knows this. Like, <laughs> ADHD he'll be like, do you want to watch this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, he'll be I like, it's called TikTok. 
<laughs> we, we'll go to we'll go to bed and it's like, hey, well, what do you want to watch? Do you want to watch this? This these are the things we have listed that we need to watch. And I'm like, you know what? Go ahead and watch that one. I'm over it. Go ahead and watch. Pretty soon he's like, we only have one show left to watch because you've lost interest in everything else. So I was almost to that point. But this last episode, because I had a lot of fun with it and it did resonate and it did have a lot of fun elements enough to kind of keep me guessing, keep me interested. Um, I like the whole alien. I like the sci-fi stuff mm. a lot. I'm really big on that. So I really enjoy the quantum, the older Quantum Leap episodes that have a lot of that in it. And so it, to me, I just enjoy this one. The, and it's fun to watch Ben have lipstick on and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, I enjoyed it a lot. Mm -hmm. Good. I really enjoyed the road trip that they had and in the old car and the driving and them together and trying to, before they had the blowout, trying to figure out how this new version of their friendship relationship, working relationship was going to work. And then the song, I only have eyes for you came on. It was like awkward, but I just loved that whole situation. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> did you notice the small mistake there, Elby? No, I didn't. Okay. He said that's the first road trip he's been on since uh, leaping. Not true. Okay. Which one was it? The, the one where he was the teenager and they were um, escaping from the abusive, um, the abusive camp. Well, I guess that's kind of a road trip. It was a short road trip, right? And then a walking trip. Is it really a road trip? They only went. I'd call it a road trip. Yeah. So maybe like that going means down his to mind is still Swiss cheese a little bit. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe yeah, but 300 miles. That's a road, road trip. trip. Right? Yeah, I don't consider that a road trip. No. I consider that like Five a run for, for your life, save yeah. your ass kind of thing. A road trip is like, hey, let's go on a road trip and have fun and have snacks in the car. And, yep. and part of know. it is shouting road trip. Right? Yeah. Shotgun. Yeah. You know, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, well, look, in my opinion, this one is the best episode they've done for season two so far. I'm very keen to see where they go. In fact, it might be my favorite of the entire new series. So, yeah, they've done a fantastic job. Really great writing. Uh, it had me engrossed and uh, didn't make me feel stupid because I had, you know, some of it thought out in my head. There's, uh, I, I also think that, you know, there's some good little seeds which we can see uh, bloom What's in the future seed? as well. <clears throat> What's that? I said, you, I said, quit saying seeds because it just <laughs> creeps me out. I seeds just, is almost as bad as mites. I don't want to hear Yes. Do I have to bleep those you, out you again? You don't want to pollinate the seeds, Michelle? No. no. Stop it. Stop it. What? What? You, you don't want to pollinate the seeds, Michelle? <laughs> no, I didn't even like it in the first thing. Oh, sorry. I didn't even like it. I didn't even like it when Sam did it, let alone... No. Well, I, I was more I, talking about like story elements that I think we're going to get. Some I, know from, I know you were. I know you were. Yeah. So I, I, I think I'm going to have to rate this one five trios of night vision goggles out of five. I can't say pairs because they had three pieces on them. Good. Five out of five. I like it. Uh, Aaron, final thoughts and rating, please, out of five. Uh, yeah, no, like we said earlier, I mean, they're getting more of a a better look at the project in present time without bogging down the story. Because that was, while I enjoyed the first season, that was part of the problem is that the season, episodes weren't long enough to give us enough time in the project, plus let us feel for the character that Sam's in. And now we're still getting some stuff from the future. But we're, we're getting enough time in the past to actually care for the characters and to establish a link with them. So, no, I, I think it's they're off to an amazing start for the second season. Um, yeah, no, I, I no complaints. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm just wondering that last scene there where or where Sam was talking to the, the government guy and they were trying to find a new place to go. And he referred him to uh, Groom Lake. Mm -hmm. In Nevada, I'm like, was well, that so? Is that the Area origins 51. of Area 51? Or because yeah. Sam didn't refer to, to, to Sam, 
that's the whole try Peggy's too, too, you know? Yeah. Right. But, so but without no, him yeah, saying that, maybe area 51 wouldn't have happened. Yeah. No. That's what I'm wondering. Is, is I that, tell you what, the funniest meme around. And every time I see it, because some time has passed, it gets funnier and funnier. It's a little picture of the internet Explorer logo in an airplane. And it says, I'm off to go and storm area 51. And <laughs> the longer it takes, the more time that passes, the funnier it gets. <laughs> Just because Internet Explorer is so slow. <laughs> yes. But no, and I would give it, uh, yeah, I would give it five night vision goggles. All also. right. All right. Hey, I picked that. You need uh, to pick a different, you need yeah, you to pick a pick different something else. Oh, oh, something different. I'm sorry. It's got to be a I different. Give it five non existent aliens. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Uh, Michelle, final thoughts on closure encounters. Closure encounters. Did anyone have closure in this? I don't know. I think it's still open wounds with Ben and Addison, but but I digress. Well, maybe I think the they're grandpa on the path. and the girls, you know. Oh, the, the um, grandpa think... and the granddaughter had closure. <clears throat> yes. Okay, I'm getting it. I'm a little slow. I don't know if you noticed, uh, but I make up for it in looks. So That's what uh, I'm Michelle... Really <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, final thoughts and you're rating um, one out of five objects from the episode. You got it. Uh, I would say that I like, like Hayden, I thoroughly enjoyed this episode. And I know I've said that a lot. I'm going to say it's probably up there as one of my favorites, if not my favorite, because I have a Dory brain as Hayden so lovingly calls it, where I forget what I've watched because I my processing disorder actually doesn't allow me I'm to never watching quantum watch. leap again. Ooh, quantum leap. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, um, but I would give it five garden gnomes. Ooh. I was all excited. I figured that out. No, I five like garden five gnomes garden for gnomes. sure. Yes. Uh, for me, I'm going to have, to, now this has, has not happened so far in the new version of Quantum Leap. I came in this, uh, to this episode probably wanting to give it a lower rating than I'm going to give it. But I feel like I've been to a little bit of a therapy session uh, talking with you, Michelle, and just talking through my problems with the episode and you helping me understand them. So I really appreciate it. So actually, after our conversation uh, here today, I actually like the episode more. Oh, so, well, fantastic. Thank I you for inviting that. me, and you're welcome. <laughs> I appreciate that because, you know, it, it's just it's something I struggled with. It's that whole awkward feeling between two exes that just mm -hmm. is a point, a part of my trauma. So it's, it's, it's something that I, I have trouble struggling with. So I appreciate you helping me talk through that. Um, I'm going to go with uh, – I'm going to give this the highest rating so far in season two. I'm going to go with six out of five bottles of Ooh. whiskey in the backseat. Six, six out of five bottles of whiskey in the back seat. So, so I really love the perfect score. Yeah. Albie, when we're done, mm -hmm. I'll send you my bill. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're a doctor now, right? Or a bachelor or a master? Master. master. You can master. never have too much toilet paper. <laughs> what? You're sending bill. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I was like, but, maybe yeah. that's what they call toilet paper in Australia is... Overall, a Master. very positive uh, feeling for this episode now. Um, I, I I really enjoyed it. Um, I can't wait to talk to Rami Lore. I think that's how you pronounce their name, the writer of this episode, and find out a little bit more. And maybe find out a little bit more about uh, the friendship or relationship between the two girls and uh, just anything else we might have missed in the episode. So uh, I'm very glad we had this chat about it. Next week on Quantum Leap, you've probably seen the preview for it, but we haven't yet. But uh, it looks like something's going down from the leap out. I jumped through time and space to save you. I'm not giving up. I will make it home. Addison, I can't get over you. Quantum Leap, next Wednesday on NBC and streaming on Peacock. In the next episode, The Lonely Hearts Club... This is the description I'm reading. Uh, in the Quantum Leap episode, The Lonely Hearts Club, Ben leaps into the body of an ambitious Hollywood assistant whose famous client, Neil Russell, is in danger. The episode aired on October 25th, 2023, and it was the fourth episode of the second season of the 22nd episode. Um, Cross-eyed. Okay, so ben, Ben's, Ben's leapt into a uh, Hollywood assistant. So, hmm, interesting. interesting. You looking forward to it, anybody? Oh, very much so. I wonder if it's going to have any Beatles references. 
Ooh, yeah. That, that is a Beatles reference, isn't it? The title? Yep. I've already seen it. I live in the future. <laughs> He's in Australia. So uh, it promises to be a good episode. Uh, I've heard it's a rom-com, possibly, or something like that. So uh, maybe a little bit of a mislead on the leap in, but that happens a lot. You know, you leap into a disco, you don't know you're a stuntman. You think you're dancing. <laughs> well, I, I had a feeling it might have been a movie set or something that he leapt into. Uh the background was kind of blurry, but I was thinking that was just like a production. They just got that shot last minute and green screened it or something. Who knows? Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that next week on the Quantum Leap podcast, Quantum Leap after show. Um, for the Quantum Leap podcast, Quantum Leap after show, I'm Albie. I'm Aaron. And I'm Michelle. And I'm Hayden. And I believe there's always a rational solution unless the equation is X squared equals two. I'm sure that's funny if you understand stuff. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> square root of two value. is an irrational number. <laughs> oh, Come on, don't make uh, me go all Pythagoras on you. I know <laughs> two is the only even prime number. Am I right on that one? Very, yes, you are right. Very hey, good. I, I got a master's something. degree and I still can't do fractions. How about that? 